Hello everyone, welcome to Moments with Mind Leaps. Uh, my name is Rebecca Davis and I'm the founder and executive director of Mind Leaps. And I'm thrilled to be here back hosting these Friday series where we have the option to talk with amazing people around the world, like the guest that's joining us right now. And we get to hear about how the arts, human rights, and different community tools are being used in places everywhere or on this globe to help people build resiliency and strength. And let me add in our guest right now, here where she is to join us. Uh, today, we're gonna to be very fortunate to hear from Hannah Smith. I've known Hannah for many, many years, and today she's gonna to be joining all the way from Carnoustie, Scotland. Hello, Hannah, how are you? Hi, can you hear me? You sound great. Can you hear me okay? I can, I can, yeah, I think it's working now. Oh, yeah, okay. I missed your accent. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's nice to see you again. Uh, thank you so much for being our guest. I was just about to tell our audience about your incredible background. Um, of course, dance brings us together first and foremost, but also you have a Master's of Arts and a Master's of Science from Edinburgh and also from London School of Economics. And you've been in New York City earlier this summer working at the United Nations De Department of Peace Operations. So we're excited to hear about all of these amazing experiences while you're still so young. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you for having me. It's so nice to see you again. Well, Hannah, you're joining from one of my fa very favorite places around the entire world. Um, not only because I do like following golf and I'm very impressed with the Carnoustie Golf Course, but also because I've had the chance to spend time in Scotland and spend time with our community there. Tell us a little bit about what Scotland is like, what Carnoustie is like for those people who have not had the chance to visit yet. Sure. So Carnoustie is a very small town. Um, it's very pretty, to be honest. I mean, it's right by the seaside. So um, it's lovely to go for walks and things. We do have a very famous golf course here. So if you're into that, then it's the perfect place to be. Um, and yeah, there's a lots of fields and things that I'm looking out to right now. So it's it's very idyllic, very quiet. Um, a far fetch from New York City, definitely. Um, but it's nice to be home for sure. Um, yeah, there's yeah, there's really not much to it, but it's it's very scenic. Carnoustie Car and New York City probably are about as far as we can get in terms of opposites. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> basically. Um, and uh, our our community there has um, spent a lot of time with Love Late projects and also with the dance company um, run by Fiona Forbes, our, our longtime friend. And I know that that's also where your passion for dance began. Share with us a little bit about how dance has been such a huge part of your life, please. Sure. So I started dancing with Fiona Forbes, actually, uh, when I was four years old. And I did that literally until I finished high school. I was in her dance school. Um, so that was definitely a huge part for me growing up as a child, as a teenager, as a young adult. Um, and I feel like for me, it was always just a way, you know, to express myself. I was a very quiet child. Um, and so it did take me a while to kind of just like get out of my shell. But I feel like dance for me was always my way to, to do that. Um, so yeah, it's definitely always been a part of of me. And even when I went to university in Edinburgh, I I joined dance classes there. You know, everywhere I've been, I've tried to kind of incorporate that into my life somehow because it is um, a very important part of 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 how I've kind of grown up. So yeah, uh, it's it's interesting how that mindset develops. I mean, I think from dance we learn all of these other skills about discipline and resilience and pushing forward and perseverance. Um, and I know that that's taken you far in your academic studies and it's also taken you to New York City <laughs> um, where one of our common conversations was which dance classes should we go to in New York City? I know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you've been to New York twice, right? Yes, I've been to New York twice now. Yeah, so once in 2018 and, and then again this year. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about your impressions of the city and then also a little bit about your work at the at the UN. Sure. So um, New York City for sure is um, I mean, it's it's very at the start, I found it very overwhelming, to be honest. It's definitely very different from where I've grown up, um, but it's just a very dynamic kind of bustling place. Um, so. Yeah, I, I, I love it now. It took me a, a little while, to be honest, to get used to it, but I do love it. And um, 
I think like the work I was doing there, um, so it was focused on uh, in peace operations at the UN. So I was working with member states um, to help um, them facilitate partnerships uh, between themselves to help them um, when they're deploying into peace operations. So it was really kind of hands on and it was super interesting work. Um, and then we also launched a, a mobile application um, to help member states learn from their past experiences uh, in, in peace operations to kind of keep improving and, and keep enhancing their um, ability, their performance, the safety of the people that are working there on the ground. So that's what I was doing while I was there. Yeah, I mean, I've asked you a lot about your, your time with the UN in our conversations because it, it's fascinating to me kind of how that entire world works as an international organization, which is so different from like the community-based civil society organizations, but you know, together they create the system of international development. Um, and I, I know that's like very interesting how people like yourself come in on rotations in a department and then rotate in and rotate out and rotate back again. <laughs> it's quite the system. Around yeah. That. Um, share with us a little bit about one thing that like people either think they know about the UN that's not true or just something like very surprising about the UN. Um, sure. So I think the UN from the outside, it's very much like it can definitely, um, people definitely have their opinions of it, which I think is, you know, very credible. Um, I think just the, the bureaucracy of it, people necessarily may maybe don't necessarily understand. So, you know, on the outside, maybe it looks like things are not really going quickly, which is often true. But I think, you know, sometimes when you're on the inside of it and you see, you know, the this, this system and how it's actually been built and established decades ago, um, you know, to understand that, then you can kind of see it in a different light, you know, and, and you understand a bit better as to why, why is this way, you know, it doesn't just, um, you can't just ask your boss to do something and the, the, the box is ticked, like you have to ask so many people and it has to go to like the super senior person. So I think that's one thing that, that people probably um, kind of from the outside, that's definitely a perspective that I've heard even my friends kind of ask me about. Yeah. I mean, that's true. I mean, even for us who, who have um, our hearts in, in Rwanda as well, and often like very critical of, of UN actions or lack of UN actions. But yeah, I mean, as you say, it's, it's moving the entire world. It's, it's not supposed to function like every other organization, right? <laughs> yeah. And I think also um, one kind of thing that is also super important to remember is that the UN is driven by member states. So it's really, I mean, it is the organization that kind of culminates them together and, and puts them in one place um but ultimately if if countries don't want something or are not willing to discuss together on something it's it's the countries that are they're the the pillar of the organization so i think that's also something that's really important to remember um because you know it, it's very easy to say well the un isn't doing this it's like okay well actually these countries need to discuss and like try to you know create um progress together that's the whole point of it right so um yeah, I'd say that's that's not it. Yeah, I mean, those of us who run companies will often argue that like just our staff doesn't move fast enough, but our staff, it's just people, right? It's now imagine yeah. that those people represents an entire country. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. The complexity that, that you're in the middle of. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I know that like the UN might circle back in your life or maybe is, is still present in, in some of your virtual work. Um, and interested in hearing more about that. Um, Although we, we do need to, to say hello to all of our Rwandan friends who are joining yeah. um, because they have been so excited, Hana, that you're a guest oh. on Pine Leaps. And they, they, as I was in Rwanda earlier this week, everyone was asking me like, well, how come she wasn't one of like your very first guests and like the very start of the pandemic? And I explained oh. to that you're actually quite busy traveling around the world and working for places <laughs> like the UN. <laughs> no, it's so nice to see everybody. So nice. Uh, Hannah, tell us a little bit about the connection that we also share with Rwanda and some of the amazing volunteer work that you've been doing for us there. Yeah, yeah. so, well, first of all, I mean, I, I should have said it right at the beginning because the reason I know you is um, through Kurnusti and through my high school teacher, Mr. Bell, um, who was really, um, I think, monumental, um, like working with you. Um, and he was such a great, a really, an inspirational teacher, um, not just for me, but also for my peers. 
Um, and so he is the reason that I'm even connected to you in any way right now. Um, so I have been gra uh, grateful to, to be able to work with the Rwanda team um, and volunteer with them for a couple of years now. So even though I've never met them before, like, I feel like I have a connection with them because every time I call them, like, I feel like I know more and more about them. <laughs> but basically, um, yeah, I've been helping to write the Inspire stories um, of the amazing kids in Rwanda at the Mind Leap Center. And I think, honestly, for me, it's been super heartwarming and just, like, I feel really, like, humble to even be able to to write these stories about the kids and the young young adults um, that they are and just hear their stories from themselves about how, you know, how Mind Leaps has changed them and how now they have these massive visions that before they didn't have. I mean, one of the little girls, she wants to be the Minister of Education in Rwanda. I don't know if you knew that, but like, you know, the, these kids are like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, so it's it's just amazing to like see what what dance can do you know and like bring them the skills to provide them to allow them you know the ability to to really go through education and be able to focus and have the determination and the grit to actually succeed and feel like they they can do something you know they they have so much ability and they're so dynamic and so positive i feel like they have so much to teach you know people in my own country um that i wish we could have like you know bigger connections like that to be able to see different perspectives and understand how how they view things because i think it's super important so yeah that's what i was doing um with bashir and vidast and all the amazing kids there so yeah well, Hannah, i have to tell you that our friends from north macedonia omer and others were, were in country with us this week and everyone kept asking like why is it called the jim bell center why is it called the jim bell center and now they're actually meeting you, Hada, um, virtually right now, as to one of the main reasons why that center even exists. And I think it's crazy to think that, like, a school teacher from Carnoustie, Scotland, who had this yeah. passion for teaching about human rights and teaching people how reconciliation is possible after a genocide, ended up coming to Rwanda with all these students and then actually having the the compassion to to provide us with that center and that's how all of like the mind program in Rwanda has blossomed into what it is today so just like your heart goes out to Jim Bell and, and the community mm -hmm. you know that mine does too and all of our friends in Rwanda it's really a spirit that will live on forever yeah well, for sure. I mean, he definitely was one of a kind. I, I've never heard any, I mean, even when I, when you meet people in the streets and, um, you know, like I, I, I feel like I always talk about mind leaps and it always circles back to Mr. Bell. Yeah. So, yeah. And it just shows you like one teacher, like just a high school teacher can actually like change an entire organization and have an imprint on the world. Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. For sure. Well, before we both start crying, um, let me move on to, I know. <laughs> to asking you more about um, how your academic career um, kind of has brought you to the United Nations, but also like how did you end up going from dance to then deciding to, to study uh, eventually human rights and then pursue a, a career at the UN and with other international organizations? Because from the outside, it doesn't look like such a linear career path. <laughs> yeah. It's true. It wasn't. <laughs> it definitely wasn't. Um, I think, to be honest, um, so first off, after high school, I, I went to study languages. Um, that was kind of my next step from, from high school. So I went to study um, interpreting and translation, which I loved and I feel like has been super interesting and useful to be able to connect with people um you know from africa in certain certain african countries uh where they speak french and also you know south america um central american countries for spanish um so that's been super interesting to be able to incorporate into the work i've done now um but i think when i got to the end of my degree i was kind of like i love interpreting and i love translation but i don't think i can do this for my whole life so maybe I'm just going to park this one for a second, try to like keep the skills and use the skills somehow. So I was trying to figure out a way to like incorporate what I had just learned for four years um, on the law of energy and time um, into something else. Um, and I feel like honestly, the start of like wanting to do something 
sort of philanthropic, I guess, um, literally came from Mr. Bell from dancing in his um, fundraising shows that he would have for his his own charity at the time, Level 8 Projects. And I kind of, that was always just something in the back of me that I always wanted to pursue, but I guess I honestly didn't know how to. Mm. So um, after my undergrad from uh, interpreting and translation, then I had the opportunity to do an internship at the UN. And so that's kind of where that um, that started that ball kind of started rolling um and i realized that actually i didn't really have any academic background in this at all um so maybe it was a good idea to learn about what i was you know learning at the un and as an intern i i'd learned so much but um i just kind of realized that human rights was really kind of a pillar of everything i was doing so that's why I went to to study human rights um, as my master's. Just I, I literally just received my diploma like two months ago. So um, very recent. <laughs> Congratulations. Um, thank you. Yeah. So I think I just wanted to learn more about it. So to try and be able to like actually step forward in this way, because otherwise, you know, it's it's all well and fine saying like, you know, I want to do this and I want to do that, but I didn't really know how to. So that for me was was my my understanding of how I could do it at least. I mean, it's different for everybody and everyone has their own roots. Um, so yeah, that's kind of where I ended up yeah. somehow. Yes, I- Not linear at all. <laughs> I, I don't know if you know this about me, but when I was transitioning from running my dance company to, to what is now Mind Leaves, there was also a moment where we were starting to do work internationally. And I was like, maybe after like your UN experience, I was like, this seems really interesting, but I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> and that's what yeah. made me go back to school to do my master's in international relations. So I think it's ah, I did it like, nice. yeah, very similar to you. Kind of when you get to a point and you're like, this is this is it, but I need to know the theory behind it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's kind of the crossroads I was at. And I was like, I need to actually have a foundation or I don't know where I'm going. Yeah, Yeah, it's like you need both, right? Because the like, I mean, you're at the UN, so you understand the the theory is critical, but actually it's like the practical implementation that makes things happen or not happen. But still, without the framework and the theory, it's hard to really do something that systems change and and has like a enough kind of like tangibility that that it sticks right that actually happens yeah no for sure Uh, definitely um and then so your is your thesis was in bodily anatomy is is what i understand bodily autonomy yeah so like um tell me about this yeah (laughs) Yeah, so I I remember also I reached out to you last year because I had so many ideas for my thesis <laughs> um, that I I wanted to I wanted to learn more about Rwanda first of all to be honest, um, but I I didn't really know how to do that, so that's why I I ended up not doing that. Um, but I I did do um, so I'm also very interested in women's rights and and um, that kind of aspect of of this work. So that's why I decided to focus my thesis on reproductive rights of refugee women and girls specifically and um, bodily autonomy. So basically um, women and girl refugees being able to make choices about their own uh, bodies and their own reproductive organs. Um, And, you know, whatever happens, I feel like that's very topical right now, I guess, um, with what's happening in the US. that was not done coincidentally, like, or on purpose, I mean. Um, but it was it was really in- interesting for me to to do that research. Um, I actually focused it on UN policy work um, and, like, the language of the policy um, and how, like, that, at least I was trying to, from what I found, I, I found that the, the language is quite limited so that it doesn't actually, at least how I, I viewed it, doesn't, really go far enough and i think it should be um more broad but then a lot of people also say you know if you go too broad then it allows you know x y and z so yeah it was really interesting topic definitely and i think it's come a very timely moment um as well so what is the situation for scotland on abortion rights since we we touched on it already what is what is the the legality of it there in your country so here it's um, it's legal up until twenty four weeks, if I'm not wrong. Um, if 
yeah and i think that's i'm not entirely sure when that was passed but it's it's kind of stable at least for now um if that's going to stay the the, the case i i'm not sure but hopefully um and yeah it's more or less the same in other parts of the uk as well uh northern ireland is a, it's a bit different okay. but in england and wales it's very similar well it, i mean the work is so important you couldn't have chosen a more important topic um or a more timely topic especially for the the connection back to the united states i know it's an issue that is close at heart to my needs too i mean in different ways there's the, of course the abortion side of it in the united states but in many of the countries where we work uh, protecting the the girl child and protecting the the women's rights to to choose marriage or to choose academics yeah. or to choose education is like at the forefront of so many conversations that we're in all the time so that work is so important and i'm so glad that you've done that and maybe you'll continue with the rwanda topic when you do your phd <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i'm, like, I'm not sure about, about phd but <laughs> I think I might draw the line at the at the masters. I don't know if I'm cut out for PhD, but I would definitely love to learn more about Rwanda. That's for sure. <laughs> well, we can find other ways of making that happen too. <laughs> um, Anna, I mean, you, you, your story and your non-linear career path, especially for someone so young, I think is an example in and of itself of how you can have multiple interests and really have kind of this passion to make a change in the world and combine different levels of academics and experiences and networks to make that happen. I wonder as you look out to, to your own future, whether or not that's in the next few months or the next several years, like what is one or a couple of the, the challenges that you want to take on? What are some of the things that are really exciting for you to aspire to as you move forward? Yeah. Um... That's a very good question. I think I'm still honestly trying to kind of find my feet. I definitely would like to work if I can on, you know, women and girls rights. That's definitely a big one for me. Um and I think climate security as well. Um you know, interlinking climate change um and risks that that causes towards specific genders and children. Um you know as we've seen the climate crisis is really devastating and kind of accelerating urgent. super quickly so yeah. um yeah it's very urgent and i think that's something that i would like to focus on and, and interlink the gender um and women girls children um aspects to that however that happens i have no idea to be honest but um i would love to do that and i'd love to honestly just keep learning about you know african cultures um latin american cultures as well and hopefully um be able to visit some of those countries at some point and actually like see them for real um that's that that's kind of my dream for the next 10 years let's say Gosh, well, I love every part of that, especially because I see that lines <laughs> could intersect in it. <laughs> no, um, for sure. I think, yeah, I mean, climate security, in addition to the work that we've already talked about, I mean, they would, they, they, the field of climate security would be like very fortunate to have your brain power and your enthusiasm and hard work for another very important issue today. Uh, uh, Hannah, I like love spending time talking to you because I feel like we can go from what is it like to be like a dance kid with Fiona to what does it mean to like change the world through academia and international organizations? Um, you are one of the most fascinating people I speak to and I'm looking forward to the chance to either see you again in New York City or if not New York, then we'll have to settle on Kigali or Kearney Street. That sounds pretty great to me. <laughs> Thank you so much for being with us today and I can't wait for our next conversation. Thank you so much for having me. It's been so great to to talk to you. Please say hello to everyone in Carnoustie for me. I miss them all so much. I will do. Thank you so much. They miss you too, Aww. for sure. We'll find a way to connect for sure. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Okay, thank you so much. Thanks everyone for joining. Thank us. you. Bye-bye. Sending hugs from Carnoustie. Thanks.